So thank you, Megan. Um, and returning to the stage next uh, for the second time this year, please welcome back fellow Casey Selden to introduce us to the Mino, women warriors of the Dahumi Empire. Hello, everybody. So um, let's get into this. I'm really, really excited to share this story with you. And we're going to... Yeah, exactly. We're getting right into it. So they often attacked at the break of dawn a mass of female warriors washing over an unfortunate village, giving no quarter to the terrified victims who, inside who are sure to meet a painful end. Once they overtook a, a new territory, the king would introduce himself to the new subjects, the rest of the army would celebrate, but these women would take off into the wilderness barefoot to go round up any defectors on either side because they would brook none of that business. Instead, they bring them back to the king for justice. I would like for you to meet the Mino. Ooh. So uh, foreign, foreign visitors, as you can see, they existed within the history of photography. They nicknamed them things like the Dahomey Amazons or the Black Spartans, uh, kind of pulling from their own traditions. But these ladies named themselves the Mino, which means the mothers in their native Fon language. It's kind of an ironic choice because if you were to join this all-female fighting troop, you weren't allowed to have... Um, even the idea of motherhood, because if you are pregnant or nursing or you loved anybody too much, you would not be ruthless enough to be part of this team. Uh, they weren't allowed to have sex or romance or marriage or motherhood at all. Um, but though it's a bit of a strange choice, it's the name that they gave themselves, so we're going to fucking use it. <laughs> now, uh, these women, they are... Um, mind-boggling remarkable. I'd like to call them Lady Terminators for their ruthlessness and their bloodthirsty nature. And they are the only all-female fighting force in all of modern military history. Let that one sink in for a minute. Um, that is something that I think should be on banners across the world. And it's surprising to me that this isn't something that isn't better known. Uh, but you might be in this moment thinking, wait a second, I know about some all-female fighting forces that kick ass. And is this, is this the same thing? Uh, you would not be alone. There are um, crackpot journalists from time to Teen Vogue recording about the similarity in these two sub-Saharan African fighting forces made up of all females who are fierce as fuck. Um, the Black Panther movie was founded off of the back of this comic book. Um, the first time the Black Panther was introduced was in 1966 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Uh, later on, it was rebooted in 1998 with some kick-ass characters like the Dora Malahe, those all-female um, bodyguard troops. And so it's kind of a natural connection that a lot of people are making. Is this the same thing? Or is one inspired by the other? So I did a little bit of my own crackpot reporting and went back to Christopher Priest who introduced the Nora Malahe and here you have their very first introduction. Do you recognize? Oh, yeah. uh, they don't really look the way that we think of them because uh, Christopher Priest in 1998 was inspired by supermodels Tyra Banks and Naomi Campbell. So you can see when they first appeared in the comics, the Dora Malahe looked a lot like their model inspirations with long flowing hair, fabulous dresses, high heeled shoes. And so our math problem is pretty simple. These are all fierce ladies, but they don't all equal each other. It is not true that in the form of the Dora Malahe, these Dahomey Mino are getting their story told and we are gonna remedy that tonight because these ladies deserve their own superhero treatment. So I've got you covered. Are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to start with their origin story, and it is, uh, here's the truth. It's not all heroic, because Dahomey's uh, economy relied on slavery. 
the practice of conquer, kidnap, sell, which is something that all African nations in the region engaged in at the time, meant that not only was the nation of Dahomey constantly in need of protecting themselves from angry neighbors, they also dealt with the effects of male depopulation as all of these men were sent to this coast. So um, as millions of men were sold into slavery, there's kind of this opening for ladies to step up and do some kick-ass things like fighting elephants. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so this is the 1650s when the king notices that this female troop of elephant warriors who call themselves the Gbeto are pretty fucking fierce. <laughs> and he's like, I want you to be my personal guard. In the palace, there are some rules that men aren't allowed to be in some certain parts of it after dark, and this is the perfect solution. So these ladies step up, and by the 1700s, and the Dahomey military expands, and they evolve into a woman-only squad of crack fighters. Their first title is the Elephant Warriors, and then another troop breaks off. They call themselves the Reapers, because that's what they're all about, guys. The recruitment uh, was pretty amazing. The Mino recorded from all quarters. So capable looking women taken from slave trades could become Mino uh, rather than being sold. A Dahomey man upset with a wife or daughter who was too crazy for him to control could be dropped off at the training grounds. Like, she's too wild. I don't know what to do. Maybe you can make a fighter out of her. And probably there were some women who were headstrong and had different ideas about their future. So they cut these fathers and husbands off at the pass and take themselves to the training grounds because they wanted more than a life of women's work. Uh, for their part, the Mino didn't really care. If you were a woman, if you were strong, and if you were willing to fight to the absolute death, they'd take you. <laughs> That was recruitment. Uh, the training, though, was a different story entirely. In order to become one of these fearsome warriors, you'd start off with like a Hunger Games style trial where you're set in the woods for 10 days with just a machete. And then you were brought back to this obstacle course that had a, um, a like a, a hill covered with acacia vines with thorns that were two to three inches long, and you'd climb over that enough times that you were insensitive to pain and couldn't feel it anymore. And then there was another level where you would take these prisoners of war who were wrapped up and couldn't move, and you would physically drop them from a height where there was no chance that they would survive, so that you would become familiar with this feeling of taking somebody's life, and it became normal to you. Uh, the purpose of this meticulous training was to turn them into battle-hungry killing machines. And the motto of conquer or die was something that they lived and died by. They were often seen as the last women standing in battle because unless expressly ordered to retreat by the king, the Dahomey women fought to the death. Defeat was not an option, nor was um, leaving the battle early this was a troop of women who had to prove themselves to all the men in the empire. But it wasn't all training and battle lust because they did have some alter egos for many women. This was a chance to escape lives of forced domestic drudgery. And if you served as a Mino, you could have the opportunity to rise to positions of command and influence. You could take prominent roles in the Grand Council. You could debate policy of the kingdom. You could even become wealthy as a single independent woman. Fancy, right? Uh, you got to live in the king's compound surrounded with supplies, tobacco, alcohol, and slaves at your disposal. You also had to make an entrance, and though the Mino lived in a time before Batmobiles and invisible planes, that did not stop them. Uh, once you were a woman in the Mino, you guys know this, they became off limits. She was forbidden from having sex, um, and the crime went both ways, so any man laying even a single finger on one of these women meant instant death for them. So she'd be preceded by a slave girl ringing a bell, and any men in the surrounding <laughs> were told to get out of the path, retire a certain distance, and look the other way. Uh, by the 1850s, Western historians started showing up on the scene and talking about how hot these babes were with all their muscles. And then they were like, oh, and they do other things too. Uh, the Mino was roughly half of the armed forces of the kingdom at this time, at about 6,000 women. 
And according to the Europeans, they were constantly judged as superior to the male soldiers in effectiveness and bravery. Yeah, <laughs> that's science right there. Unfortunately, though the Mino were unmatched among their neighbors in West Africa, they couldn't compete with the military might of 19th century Europe. Uh, this is the period of time when everybody wants to conquer the kingdom, and the Mino are armed with machetes, spears, flintlock rifles, maybe Winchesters if the business is good. Uh, as you can see, they have no shoes, they have no armor, and they're going up against the French in the 19th century who have gunboats, cannons, Gatling guns, and even though there was no balance, they were completely unmatched, they still made the French fight for it and um, fought 24 battles with these motherfuckers before they went down. Uh, there is a final scene, though, because as always the last of the king's force to surrender, most of the Mino died in battle over the course of the fighting with the French. Out of nearly 4,000 that fought in the last four battles, only 50 warriors remained at the end. Uh, the majority of these women sailed for America, where they ended up at Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, of all things. <laughs> And that's the end of their story, but not the end of ours. Um, I do want to reiterate this point. The Mino deserve a unique place in history for the women around the world have always fought. They've always done so um, with some caveats. They were integrated into largely male units or the female only military units had a supportive role or they were only part of a one single combat. And we've got a lot of history of fierce successful warrior queens like Cleopatra and Shi Shi, the, the Chinese pirate, uh, the amazing Zinga of Matamba, this is a new one to me from Angola, a ruler who fought the Portuguese, quaffed the blood of sacrificial victims, kept a harem of 60 male concubines who she dressed in women's clothing. That is a story for another night, <laughs> obviously. Nor are female guards unknown. Here we have the King of Siam, who was memorably portrayed by Yul Brenner in The King and I. He had a bodyguard of 400 women, but we also have more modern examples from Iran, Libya, and Israel. Uh, but none of these women were on the vanguard. Uh, what made the Dahomey women warrior unique was that they fought in the front line and fe frequently died for their king and their country. I feel like this isn't something that you can make too much of a point about. Their legacy left the Dahomey Empire larger than it had ever been in history. Their superior fighting skill allowed Dahomey to conquer the entire territory known today as the country Benin, along with most of modern day Nigeria and other neighboring countries were larger, much more powerful, but the Dahomey with its menial warriors was more terrifying and ultimately more successful. So the Mino existed as a distinct female military tradition, frontline female fighters for hundreds of years, and this phenomenon has not been seen anywhere else at any time in history. I think uh, this story fits perfectly with tonight. I'm really excited that Michael invited me to tell it because these are wild fighters who lived wild lives, but honestly, the wildest thing about this tale is that their story isn't more wildly known. Um, Black Panther and its success are raising the profile of fierce female warriors and helping the Mino's cause and readers of uh, these hard-hitting journalists from Time to Teen Vogue, like my cute mom, who has been a lifetime reader of Time, and my cute teen mom, <laughs> who's too cute not to include. Uh, they all know at least the name of these warriors. They have a seed to begin their self-edification, and you guys do too. And so what I want to do tonight is ask you to spread that seed and let folks know that these are real heroines of history. And if somebody asks you if you've heard of Black Panther, you know what to tell them. Let's raise a glass to the Mino. Thank you, Casey. Uh, and thank you, everyone. So uh, we are uh, almost ready for a break. Uh, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, 
Adventure Harvey. So um, in case you haven't seen yet, up on stage here, we have uh, our themed Harvey for the night. Uh, and also Barbara over there at the merch table is holding up several other of our Adventure Harveys. So Adventure Harvey, Harvey is our mascot. He is a Wolpertinger. Uh, like all of us here, he is many, many things altogether. Um, and he travels the globe. Uh, most recently, Krampus Harvey was uh, taking some time off of scaring children and visiting Cancun. Uh, Harvey was remembering fondly his 2016 trip to New Zealand where he explored Eorakai Mount Cook. Uh, he was also uh, remembering that one time he went to Watarka National Park in Central Australia and visited Kings Canyon. And also, uh, back in San Francisco, several of Harvey's frenemies gathered in the BART system to plot his downfall and or a surprise party, we're not quite sure. Uh, but these and many other amazing things are available at the merch table. Ray and Barbara over there. There are uh, lovely glasses, there are Harveys, uh, there are all, all sorts of things that help us make this crazy thing happen. So uh, if during intermission you'd like, please visit the merch table uh, where you'll find a whole bunch of things including some t-shirts and hoodies, uh, some custom Odsel and glassware, Adventure Harveys, which are made by Isolde Honoré, uh, who's wandering around here somewhere. <laughs> Handmade. Um, also, there's buttons and stickers, and uh, for those of you who come here often, there are advanced discount tickets for upcoming salons, so please consider that. Uh, and Wild Harvey is available while supplies last. Uh, and if you haven't already, uh, you can also enter to potentially win a uh, Odd Salon uh, Wild Harvey, uh, which will be drawn after the cocktail break. So make sure that you put your name into the drawing, which is also over at the merch table. See, we try to get you at the merch table. See, it's a plan. Um, and when we come back from break, we're gonna have three more stories. We'll have the wild girl of champagne. We will have the forgotten history of East Berlin's gay bars. And last but not least, unless you're talking about size, it's the barrage in the garage, spider versus scorpion. So, it is cocktail time. We'll see you back here in about 15 minutes.